is fine. Yeah, I think so. so. Oh. I think it's going to stay stable now. Okay, so, so this is why I came early. <laughs> yeah. So, a mí es un placer introducir hoy al profesor Mark Fallen de la Universidad de Warwick, en el Reino Unido. Él es, eh, su background, él es médico, se licenció en Ciencias Médicas en la Universidad de Cambridge y hizo el doctorado en el Imperial College sobre enfermedades infecciosas y desde hace más de 15 años es una de las referencias mundiales en temas de genómica y metagenómica bacteriana. Entre otras de sus, digamos, contribuciones seminales, pues está entre otras el libro Pathogenomics, el que publicó en 2007 con otros colaboradores, que es el primer libro de texto sobre genómica, genómica bacteriana, principalmente enfocada en bacterias, y recientemente, el mes pasado, en diciembre, publicó un review, Nature Microbial Reviews, on, sobre, perdón, sobre los 20 años desde que ha empezado la genómica bacteriana. So, pero además de ser un profesor en genómica microbiana, es un, es un gran apasionado de la evolución humana y trabaja desde hace bastante tiempo en DNA antiguo, tanto de carácter humano como de otro tipo de comunidades. So, Mark, so it's a Thank pleasure you. for me to introduce uh, and Dr. Please. Thank you. Well, I'd like to give the talk in Spanish, but I don't want to ruin, murder the language of Cervantes uh, here in his neighborhood. So, I'll continue in English. Um, and the first thing I have to say is that uh, in front of paleoanthropologists, I have to say I know nothing. I know that I know nothing um, in that I'm a bacteriologist and I happen to work on, uh, on bacterial genomes and metagenomes and then I have stumbled into the area of ancient DNA work. Uh, so this is Socrates who said I know that I know nothing. I mean, I, I suppose one claim to fame is I have written a book called The Rough Guide to Evolution, which I wrote a popular account of evolution um, and uh, had to cover a lot of ground in that to actually uh, understand the background. But I do feel very humble speaking to professional paleoanthropologists. So if I, if I make any uh, mistakes in, in my use of, of, of jargon, then please forgive me. And what I was thinking I would cover is I'd look at in part one what ancient DNA can tell us about relationships between anatomically modern humans and archaic hominins. Now this is not an area in which I've done any research. It's an area which over the last several years I have lectured undergraduates on because I uh, was asked to do it and I found it very interesting. Um, and so I will present some of the material that I presented to undergraduates, slightly compressed. Uh, then I can tell you a little bit about what ancient DNA can tell us about pathogens of the past, bacterial pathogens, and there I will be talking about my own work. And I'll also speak a little bit about some work we've done on sedimentary ancient DNA and what that can tell us about past landscapes and lifestyles. So let's start with Neanderthal. So Neanderthal is the name of a valley uh, near Dusseldorf in Germany. And this valley was named after a 17th century pastor whose name was Joachim uh, Neumann. And I don't know quite why. It was obviously the fashion to use classical nomenclature. They turned Neumann, which means Newman, into Neander when they named the valley after him. And one of the uh, strange annoyances was that the original spelling of Neanderthal with, with an H but there was a German spelling reform in 1901 which took out the H. So in modern German, you wouldn't use the H. But the problem is that Neanderthal, the Neanderthal people were named before that spelling change and the old form is still used taxonomically. And in fact, both forms are still used in paper. So if you do a search of the literature, you have to put in with the H and without the H. Uh, and it tends to have broken down into the fact that in the UK we put the H in because we're a bit old fashioned. In the US they take the H out. So if you publish a pa paper in Nature on Neanderthal, you put the H in. If you publish a, paper, publish a paper in Science, you leave the H out. Anyway, that's a small point really. The interesting thing was the discovery of Neanderthal man there. Um, and this was the result of. Uh, industrialization in that area. There were numerous caves and, and rock shelters along the valley um, and there was one particular uh, cave called the Kleiner Feldhof Quarter um, and 
In the, in the 1850s, as uh, Germany was starting to industrialise, they needed lots of limestone, and they be began quarrying, and they started to remove these caves and valley walls. Um, but as part of the discoveries of, uh, as part of doing that, they discovered things in them. So, uh, in August 1856, um, a skull cap and 15 postcranial bones were recovered from this site. And they were first thought to be a cave bear, and then they were shown to a local teacher, a natural historian, Fulwatt, who said, oh no, these are human, but not human as we know it. Um, and they were written up uh, for publication in 1857. Um, in fact, it turns out that this was a very timely discovery, because it was just a, a, a couple of years later that Darwin wrote Origin of Species, and the whole issue of, of, of evolution came to the fore. And it turns out, in fact, there were some prequels. There were discovery of Neanderthals in Belgium and in Gibraltar. And in fact, Darwin himself handled uh, uh, the, 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 the Gibraltar uh, Neanderthal skull. So kind of Darwin did come to, to grips with that. So this is sort of what it looks like today. So I went there in um, November last year. And um, the river is running along here. And... This used to be a gorge with the, the limestone coming all the way up the cliffs to the side of the river. It's all been blown away, knocked down, quarried away. And th this is the, where the, the original site was thought to be. And about 15 years ago, uh, some people went back and said, well, let's see if we can find where the original site is. And they didn't have clear documentation. And also because the the um, landscape had changed, they were a bit stuck, but they managed using ancient, uh, uh, not ancient, uh, historical lithographs from the 18th and, and early 19th century to line up the landscape that they could see the various landmarks, and they made a best guess as to where the original discovery was made. They dug up what was there, and they found more Neanderthal bones. And interestingly, one of the Neanderthal bone fragments that they found in that excavation fitted like a piece of a jigsaw into one of the original bones from the original uh, Neanderthal yeah. um, discovery. So that's quite remarkable. In fact, what it's thought to, it's thought to have happened is over here to the, to the left, there's still this escarpment there, and that's probably where the original cave was. Um, and all the material just, as during the mining, just got pushed down into this flat area. Um, and so probably just over here where the original Neanderthal uh, cave was found. They've got a very nice um, museum there, and they've got reconstructions of Neanderthals, and one of their particularly provocative ones is they put a Neanderthal there just as a modern, in a modern suit. Doesn't look that much different from the kind of people you see working in a bank nowadays. Um, <laughs> And if you like, here is a, an aged, matched, anatomically modern human alongside the Neanderthal. So you can see that there are some similarities um, and there are some differences. Um, now, the interesting thing about Neanderthals is that they, they're trying to understand their relationship to modern humans is not straightforward. Um, and particularly over the last 20, 30 years, the idea has taken hold that actually modern humans originate in Africa and all of us who live outside of Africa have common ancestors relatively recently that left Africa. Whether it was 72,000 years ago or 60,000 years ago or 100,000 years people are still arguing about the exact t uh, timing of it. But the dogma was that anatomically modern humans left Africa, uh, some of them went uh, in the direction of Europe, some of them went into Asia, some of them, there's this idea of beach coma hypothesis, that some of them went along the beach and ended up in Australia. But of course, as they left um, Europe, the modern humans would have come into the range of the Neanderthals. And the most recent dating suggests that there probably was about 5,000 years where anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals were together in Europe. And that raises the tantalising question of what kind of relationship was there between them? Did they interbreed? Was it any genetic exchange? So the question was, you know, Neanderthals died out in one sense. Uh, they, they, there are no modern Neanderthals wandering around. But did that Neanderthal lineage just die out? Or 
was there exchange, genetic exchange, between um, the humans, and certainly modern humans who had left Africa and Neanderthals? Now, one answer, one approach that you can use is ancient DNA. In fact, before ancient DNA, I think, I don't know, this pro probably wouldn't have been resolved very well. Um, it, 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 the evidence uh, from morphology is, is a bit tricky, um, and DNA really has clarified this. And there's been some spectacular successes with, with ancient human DNA. There are problems with this approach. You do have a risk of DNA from the handlers, so human DNA from the handlers getting into the material. And in the past, people used to use polymerase chain reaction, PCR, amplify. And the problem with that approach is that once you've used a pair of primers once in your lab, it's very easy to contaminate the whole environment with the, the products of your PCR. And so there was this continual problem that PCR uh, carryover was going on and contaminating things. And there were some spectacular uh, failures. So it turns out, I'm, I'm getting kind of get ahead of myself because I've merged two, two talks together. But there were some contamination when the, in the first attempt to sequence Neanderthal uh, genomes. And Egyptian mummies is a highly contentious area. Um, Svante Pabo, who is kind of the godfather of ancient DNA, particularly applied to humans, um, had his very first paper on ancient DNA saying he'd amplified some DNA from a mummy, but it turned out it was his own DNA he'd amplified. Um, and still to, to, to today, there are some people who say you can get DNA from Egyptian mummies, but there are a large number of people who say, no, this is all just contamination and, and nonsense. So it's, it's a quite a contentious area, I have to say. Now, I started lecturing on this um, a, f a few years ago. It must have been about 2008, I think, 2007. And at that time, the evidence that was available was all from uh, mitochondrial sequences. And um, so the mitochondrion is a, an organelle. It's a, in fact, it's a, ba a bacterium that's kind of become intracellular. And it has its own small genome. But that genome is present in many more copies than the nuclear genome. So it's an attractive uh, target if you want to just get some kind of genetic information. And people have been able to amplify up bits of Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA from Neanderthal samples. Um, and by the time we got to about 2007, we actually had multiple sequences of Neanderthals. Now, in interpreting the sequences, there were, there were some problems because you could say, well, this is very old sequence, and maybe any differences you see from modern sequences are because it's very damaged. Um, but in fact, that um, was dismissed because uh, people started to get ancient DNA from anatomically modern humans. And when you looked at that DNA sequence, it, fit, it fitted within the range of variation you see in modern humans. And the Neanderthals always sat outside. And the Neanderthals agreed with each other in many positions against, so at the top there, the CRS Cambridge reference sequence is the modern human sequence, and you can see coloured in lots of positions where the Neanderthals agreed with each other but didn't agree with the, with the, with the human. And so this led to the assumption at that time that Neanderthals were a separate lineage, and in fact, probably a separate species. They were given, initially given a species name, Homo. Uh, Neanderthalensis, and the, uh, uh, and the prevailing hypothesis at that time was that there was no admixture, little or no admixture, a separate species, and the out of Africa th hypothesis, the recent African origins hypothesis, was considered preeminent, um, and that we all walked out of Africa, our ancestors were obviously black, they walked into Europe and Asia, turned a bit pale, um, but it, we we all came from Africa. And um, if you're interested in the links between art and science, um, you should Google a YouTube video uh, called I'm an African, which is a piece of work I commissioned from a rap artist that speaks to the out of Africa hypothesis and tells us all about the fact that we are all Africans. Maybe we can play it at the end if we've got time. Um, but that was how it looked. But then we developed that there was a new technology came on board that really transformed the prospects uh, for genomics across the board in human genomics, medical applications, but also ancient DNA. And this 
um, was the advent of high throughput sequencing. So this allowed us to, to sequence uh, much more uh, cost effectively and much more uh, and very user friendly approach and also gave us much, much greater depth of coverage. So we could sequence thousands of times more DNA, even tens of thousands of more times DNA than we could before. So what this technique involves is you add adapters to the DNA, you then amplify up those uh, fragments that you've got the adapters on, denature them, and then you hybridize them to this two-dimensional surface which has been populated with DNA sequences, adapter sequences, um, and you end up building molecular colonies on that surface and then um, you then sequence those colonies uh, by um, adding sequential nucleotides and then when, when it pairs up it fluoresces and, it, and you record this with a camera. And this approach was ideal for ancient DNA work because it allowed massive throughput so you could sequence millions of sequences in a single experiment in a week, tens of millions even. Um, and it also, uh, it, it, it had high throughput, but short read lengths. Now, in many applications, having short read lengths, you can only read little bits of sequence, 100 base pairs or 60 base pairs or whatever. In many applications, that's seen as a disadvantage. But in ancient DNA work, the ancient DNA is already being fragmented down to that kind of level. So having a longer read length didn't matter. It wasn't any loss to go to the short read lengths. So this approach was, was applied in the ancient DNA studies. And in 2010, we got the first draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome. Um, and this effort was led by Svante Pabo, who's been one of the pioneering uh, guys in this field. And um, he basically took uh, some samples um, from this site in Croatia of India and uh, three bones, and they got Neanderthal uh, sequences, three different uh, samples there analyzed, and they were able to um, here look at the divergence between Neanderthal nuclear genome and human genomes, and show that there were clearly differences, that Neanderthal sequences were skewed away from the variation seen in modern humans. And they were able to do comparisons between the chimp, with the chimp genome, and anatomically modern human genome. At that time, it's kind of strange to think about it, but at that time, the anatomically modern humans, all of us, were represented by Craig Venter's genome. Um, so they compared against Craig Venter's genome. And they found a number of changes in the Neanderthal that affected protein sequences in the anatomically modern human lineage, in our lineage. So the things that make us anatomically modern human you could start to dissect what those changes were at the genomic level. Um, and several proteins where there was uh, more than one amino acid change. It's a bit of a shopping list, and we still, nobody has a, a real understanding of all of the changes that have happened in, in terms of evolution. There's some copy number changes as well. But that, that's, that's kind of the biology, and that's not so interesting as the question about what about the genetic relationships. The question, are some Neanderthals, are Neanderthals related more closely to some anatomically modern humans than to others? And so what they did in the paper was they compared sites where there were derived SNPs, where it was a derived state in Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans, and then looked at those sites in um, Neanderthals and a range of humans, European Americans, East Asians, and West Africans. And what they found in their first look was that the Neanderthal genomes were significantly closer to the genomes of non-Africans than they were to Africans. Now that was a surprise, and it was a double surprise, because, as I said before, the dogma at the time, or not quite a dogma, but the assumption at the time was there had been no admixture, no inbreeding. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise to find that there was any evidence of that. But the other thing was it was assumed that if there was any signal it would be in Europeans, but not in Asians, that, that they would have come into Europe and bred in Europe. Uh, and if you take a Chinese genome, you wouldn't see any Neanderthal. But in fact, that wasn't what they found. They found that all of the genomes from people from outside of Africa had some uh, uh, Neanderthal sequences. So they confirmed this by more detailed comparisons with these different ethnic groups. 
and uh, they were able to show that the direction of flow was from Neanderthals to, to non-African humans, and Craig Venter had some parts of his genome that were more Neanderthal than they were African. And they came up with this figure of a few percent, one to four percent of non-African genomes uh, is Neanderthal. So in one sense, the Neanderthals are not extinct. They live on all of us in this room here. Um, if you take the, there's probably one Neanderthal genome equivalent in the room at the moment. Um, and so when we look at the, uh, what's happened, we've got the, this branch point here where the two populations separate and then Neanderthals make a, a genetic contribution to this branch here between the West Africans. So one of the interesting things about anatomically modern humans there is a deep branch between the, the bushman, the, the sun uh, bushman, and the rest of humans. Um, but the anatomically modern, uh, but the uh, Neanderthals interbred here with uh, this branch here after we left Africa. Now, nowadays, uh, we kind of accept this as normal. So I sent my DNA to a service called 23andMe, based in the US. They'll genotype many, many thousands, tens of thousands, I think, of SNPs, and they tell you how much of you is Neanderthal. So I am 2.8% of my genome is Neanderthal. Um, and the average 23andMe user is 2.7%. Turns out that my daughter is 2.7% from which I conclude that my wife must be even less Neanderthal than my daughter. Um, and um, so there we are. And um, yeah, Neanderthal and proud, 2.7% Neanderthal. In fact, uh, over the last few years, this, this whole area of research has just exploded with paper after paper in nature and science, um, exploring what this all means. And it turns out that when you look at that Neanderthal uh, contribution to the to, to Eurasian genomes, it's not just smeared out across the whole genome. There are some parts of the genome which are very rich in Neanderthal sequences, and there are other areas that might be called Neanderthal deserts. And what this is taken to mean is that some of those haplotypes that came in from Neanderthals provided a selective advantage um, and were selected for in Europeans and, uh, and, and Asians, and others were... Uh, selectively disadvantageous. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in, the, in, 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 in actually investigating uh, the, the Neanderthal contribution to our uh, genomic heritage. There's a recent paper where they looked at now hundreds of genome sequences from Europeans and Asians, and they recovered uh, 15 uh, gigabase pairs of intergress sequence spanning about 20% of the Neanderthal genome. So this is just from looking at modern humans. They can, re re they can get this 20% of the Neanderthal genome back again. Um, and the point they made here was that, that the average length of the intergress was about 57 kilobase pairs, substantial amount of DNA in each segment, and that 26% 20 uh, of all protein coding genes had one or more exons. So a quarter of, the, of your proteins are encoded by genes that have some Neanderthal ancestry uh, somewhere. Now that was um, a pretty cool finding, I think, really quite striking. And when I was teaching, I've been teaching on this to undergraduates, it's been like a, just a, a, roll, a roller coaster uh, every year having to come in and say new things, different things, surprising things. But this is a quote here from Hamlet, from Shakespeare, our famous, most famous playwright, uh, more things in heaven and earth than that dreamt of in your philosophy. And one of the most remarkable things was the finding of a whole new genome in a little finger bone around that size there uh, from a cave in southern Siberia. So this started off in, in 2010 with the recovery of a mitochondrial DNA genome from this um, finger bone found in uh, the Denisova cave, found in 2008 in the Altai Mo Mountains in southern Siberia. And what they uh, concluded when they sequenced this was that this represented a new lineage of humans that was distinct from anatomically modern humans and from Neanderthals. Um, now, I have a uh, 
friend, colleague, uh, Alice Roberts, who's a kind of anatomist and um, she does some archaeology TV programs and she did a thing called The Incredible Human Journey. And we were once doing a joint presentation and I, I made, made a comment about this and she said, it's, it's just a little finger bone. I said, well, it may be just a little finger bone to you, but to me it's a whole new genome. Uh, and to the scientific community, it was a whole new genome to have this new Denisova hominin genome. Um, so here is the phylogenetic tree that they drew up in the paper. Uh, they took a, a wide range of anatomically modern humans here, um, and you can see that, as you expect with the out of Africa hypothesis, the Africans are up there, and everything out of Africa is over here as a separate branch. Neanderthals out there was a separate branch in blue, and the Denisovans separate from that. So they, in this first paper, they were they were guesstimating about 4, 466,000 years ago was the split between anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals, and that the Denisovans maybe a million years ago, uh, in their first uh, thing. And the site of the cave there is number sixty-two. You can see where it is, really slap bang in the middle of the Eurasian continent, uh, pretty much. And then as uh, the years folded, unfolded over uh, the next couple of years, they went from having a mitochondrial genome to having a, a light coverage, 1.9-fold uh, coverage genome of a Denisovan. And then they went on to having a high coverage genome, 30-fold coverage genome of the Denisovan. Um, and what they found then was another surprise. When, when they first got any gene, nuclear genome at all, they realized that actually there were Denisovan sequences in some anatomically modern humans, that the Denisovan lineage had seemed to contribute about 4 to 6% of the genetic material found in present-day Melanesians. So people from Papua New Guinea, even Australian Aborigines as well, have a contribution from this particular archaic human lineage, which is rather uh, weird, to th all discovered from a finger bone uh, from a, a cave in the middle of Siberia. So the, the pattern of evolution then started to look like this. So we had a split between the Densovans and us and the Neanderthals, and they donated some DNA into this uh, lineage that's represented by Papua and the Guineans, and then the Neanderthals uh, contributed later on to um, humans out of Africa. Well, not later on, they contributed also to the humans out of Africa. And over the last couple of years, there's been a number of papers looking at what do these contributions from archaic lineages actually mean for biology? And it turns out they do mean something. It's not just like uh, uh, without any consequence. It seems that so here's an example where um, the immune part of the immune system, the HLA antigens, uh, many of these annuals are being found in humans actually come into humans from uh, other groups, so the Neanderthals in particular, uh, uh, sorry, the Denisovans in particular with one of these HLA and, uh, and now more and more has been uh, tracked down to Neanderthals. And here's a paper that came out just a few weeks ago where they, they're saying that many of the modern diseases of Europeans, so uh, problems you get with skin exposure, uh, sun exposure, uh, hypercoagulation, tobacco use, these are actually alleles derived from Neanderthals. So it's amazing that we've seen this whole topsy-turvy view, uh, yeah, turning things upside down, to show now that, that this, not only that this admixture occurred, but it made an important contribution to our, to our biology and, and, in fact, to our health, uh, in a sense. And this is just an amazing film because the papers just kept coming and coming over the last few years. So they then got another uh, Neanderthal genome, from uh, a Neanderthal from the same area of Siberia as the Denisovans um, and were able to show that there were different uh, gene flow events. I'll explain, uh, I'll illustrate that in, in a moment. Um, and then uh, this one from a 45,000 year old modern human from Western Siberia, anatomically modern human. So not long after the supposed exit from Africa and around some time after leaving Africa, or just before leaving Africa, and some really modern humans must have interbred with Neanderthals to explain what's going on. This individual, they were able to see that the Neanderthal contribution 
was much more solid than it is, and much more easy to see than it is in, in modern day humans, that the blocks of Neanderthal sequence were longer, um, and they were able to work out that probably the, the, the gene flow into the ancestors of the individual occurred about 7,000 to 13,000 years before he lived. So it's amazing that we can look back in time. And then uh, more recently, this paper where they showed that uh, uh, an anatomically modern human from Romania who um, lived around 37 to 42,000 years ago, um, not long after the disappearance of the Neanderthals, this individual had 6 to 9% of its genome was derived from Neanderthals. So that's equivalent to having an ancestor four to six generations ago. So it could, could have had a great-great-grandmother, is that right? Great-great-great-grandmother that was Neanderthal. Um, and in this diagram here, these green blocks are blocks, whole blocks of Neanderthal genome that are represented in that, in, in that individual's genome. So things have got, in the field of ancient DNA and, and, some, uh, and human relationships, things have got very tangled and messy. And this, uh, from that paper on the complete genome of Neanderthal from the Altai Mountains, uh, a guy, David Reich, who's an associate of, um, uh, of Svante Pabo, and a very smart guy, has managed to reconstruct a, a number of different genetic exchanges. And actually, they now think that there is a... Yet another uh, branch, another lineage, uh, archaic hominin lineage, which contributed to the, the Denisovans. Um, but Neanderthals contributed here, as you can see, to anatomically modern humans. The Denisovans did as well. Um, and also the Neanderthals contributed to the Denisovan. Um, so it's, uh, the, the, there's a whole range of things going on here. Um, and there was a paper written recently looking at all this, and they, they made this point, sparing, be sparing with Occam's razor. So Occam's razor, the idea that you just look for simple explanations, the simplest explanation you come along with, where well, it doesn't look like the human, recent human evolution was that simple, and that we can't draw simple conclusions. Now, just earlier today, we went to the, the site at Atapuerca, and um, here in the, the, this site, the Cima de los Huesos, they found these uh, multiple individuals um, from about 400,000 years ago and one femur has recently fed, well the year before last, given up a DNA sequence and that DNA sequence has also revealed some strange findings. So as I say this subject is just utterly fascinating because every year something new comes along and the new thing that came along here was that there was this kind of assumption that the, these individuals found here showed early Neanderthal features that they were on the lineage leading towards uh, Neanderthals um, and uh, therefore you'd have expected that they would be, if, if, if you look at the DNA, they'd be on the Neanderthal branch. But in fact when they captured this sequence and analysed it, they turned out to be on the Denisovan branch. And it's unclear quite what that means. Does it mean that they, that this group of individuals actually are the Denisovans? And one of the weird things is that there's, there's been no morphology really, apart from a couple of teeth on the Denisovans. Or everything that we reconstructed has been from genome sequences and we've never seen their cranial or postcranial morphology, so it is possible that that's the case. Or does it represent something else? Is it that, that maybe there was interbreeding and just the mitochondrion had gone across, um, but the nuclear genome would still be on the Neanderthal branch? And I understand, and people in this room may know more than me, that a nuclear genome of this individual is now in preparation, and we will soon have the answer to that question. So it's just endlessly fascinating. Now, I've gone on a bit long about human stuff. Um, if you're interested... There's this book by Santa Fe called Neanderthal Man in Search of Lost Genomes, where he's written a memoir of the last uh, 20, 30, 25 years or so, working with ancient DNA, and actually it's a re he's made remarkable process, uh, uh, progress. And I think he's, you know, he's one of those individuals that has changed the way people think and the way they work. And 
He's also a slightly odd individual, so it's worth reading the memoir just to, to come across the, the kind of quirky way in which he thinks and describes things as well. Anyway, I, I need to move on quickly. Um, so in terms of my own work, I'm interested in pathogens from the past and using ancient DNA in that regard. And we got involved in this field a couple of years ago, well, three or four years ago, um, and at that time, there was a literature, substantial literature out there showing that you could get bits of DNA from a, a number of pathogens. Um, and one of the triumphs was the paleogenomics of the Black Death, in actually getting the genome of Yersinia pestis that caused the Black Death in Europe. Um, and there have also been some advances on TB, which I'll mention in a moment. Working with pathogens is quite a lot easier than working with human ancient DNA because there's much less risk of contamination from the handlers and the environment. So Gemma, who's been doing some of this work, if you look at her, she doesn't look like she's got TB. She's unlikely to cough her sputum containing TB onto the sample and contaminate it with TB. But nonetheless, even in this field, and I'm quite surprised how, um, how much difficulty there is argument between people and... and uh, you know, cross words in the field. There are people that say that much of the work that's been done on ancient DNA is rubbish. It's all contamination. Because a lot of it has been done, almost all of it's done, been done in the past using PCR and you can contaminate your PCR and, and therefore maybe it's all, all nonsense. Um, and there's been, even in print, there's been some really cross words between certain individuals about this kind of thing. Now we, we got interested in this because we were speaking to people who had some historical TB samples and they said, you know, do you think you could get any sequences out of it? And I said, well, I would be interested to have a go, but I'm not going to start setting up a load of PCRs. Uh, it's a lot of effort in terms of sorting out the, the lab environment to do so. And everyone will say, oh, it's all just contamination. Um, and we had just had a paper where we've been using a, a technique called shotgun metagenomics, where you just extract the DNA from the sample and just sequence it en masse. We'd had a paper where we'd shown in the German E. coli outbreak uh, that we could actually get the outbreak strain from the metagenome of the, of, the, of, uh, of fecal metagenome from that outbreak. So I said, why don't we just have a go? And one of the great things about the uh, availability of high throughput sequence and the ease of use is that you can just have a go. Um, and so I said, you know, the, the other good thing is you don't, you don't have to design PCR primers and you don't have to design uh, probes to capture things. So you're not making a clear assumption of what's in there. You basically just sequence all the DNA and then you do the, the hard work, the analysis is done in the bioinformatics afterwards. Now, one of the problems is that if you sit in your armchair, you can always think of things that will go wrong and say it's not worth doing. Um, and there's a famous uh, Englishman, John Snow, who came up with this, uh, I think, quite a telling phrase, is, why think, why not do the experiment? Uh, you know, why we, and that was our attitude. All right, well, it's probably not going to work because there's probably going to be too much human DNA in these samples, and there's probably going to be post-mortem contamination with all sorts of other bacterial or swamp any signal from the pathogen, but let's have a go. Um, so we did this work with Helen Donoghue, who's shown here, and we've had this tape paper published uh, about a year ago now in Nature Communications. Now to provide some historical context to this work, um, in, the, in, in the middle of Hungary, in the northern part of Hungary, in the middle there, there's this town of Vaps um, on the eastern banks of the Danube. And in 1994, they were doing some renovation in this church here, um, which is uh, a, a Catholic church, Dominican church there, um, and they discovered a crypt which had been sealed um, for over a century. It turned out this crypt had been used for the burials of the middle class Catholic families and clerics from that town from 1731 to 1838. And for reasons that are still not entirely clear, many of the bodies became naturally mummified. So there was still quite a large amount of soft tissue associated with it. They hadn't become completely skeletonized. And we started work on this individual, we got a bit of lung from this lady, Terezia Hausman, who died on the 26th of December 1797, at the age of 28. 
Um, these samples, these mummies, have been investigated um, around 2003, 2005. There's a guy, Mark Spiegelman, who is a remarkable guy. He's an um, Israeli, British, Australian surgeon who, at the age of 50, decided that he also wanted to become an archaeologist and did a degree in archaeology. And he went in and sampled these uh, bodies uh, using a fibre optic endoscope to take biopsies. And they also took chest x-rays and, uh, and other things. The chest x-ray in this case was clear, didn't show any obvious signs of TB, but this individual was very much wasted, cachectic as we call it in, in, in medical jargon, which was consistent with a diagnosis of TB. And some of the chest samples, when they were taken out, they were analysed by uh, PCR. In fact, they were analysed by microscopy, conventional acid fast staining, which showed there was evidence of TB in this individual. Um, one of the interesting things with this individual and the others in this crypt is that for many of them we have the physical remains, but we also have written documentation. So this is the death record of this individual. So we know exactly when they died as well. So to cut a long story short, because I'm trying to cover too much too quickly, we uh, ended up um, in a subsequent analysis. We did the first analysis on Tourette's Hausman. Then we went and looked at eight of these bodies in more detail. And from them, we were able to recover TB genomes. Um, and in some cases, we could get coverage you know, around one-fold, five-fold. But in a, in a couple of cases, we were getting much higher than that. So in Tourette's Hausman, we were getting over 300-fold coverage of the genome, and in another genome, another body, we're getting over 180 fold coverage. And I still don't really understand this. Why was it so successful? Uh, and one potential explanation is that the TB continued to grow after death. So this individual died, and the, the mycobacterium tuberculosis chewed away at their lung and was living off it. The thing is, we, nobody's ever gone in and sampled a TB lesion in a living individual and extract the DNA and sequence it to see how much DNA and how much genome coverage you get. But I'm actually surprised that, we, that this works so well. But the other thing that we found, well, we found all of the genomes we, we got, we got 14 genomes out of these eight individuals, and they all had a particular deletion that showed that they belonged to one particular lineage, the so-called Euro-American lineage of TB. But another surprise here was that, that many of them had mixtures of different genotypes in the same body. So five out of the eight actually had more than one TB genotype. And one body, in fact, actually had three different genotypes. Now, when uh, I was told about this, I just said, this doesn't really make sense. To me, as a, someone who's medically qualified, you just catch TB with one strain. And that's it, isn't it? That was my assumption. We all carry these working assumptions in our head. And we were saying, well, does this mean that there was some difference between what happened in Europe back then in the, in the 18th century and what we see now? Or is it some artifact? Now, one of the interesting things, if you look at the graph of the prevalence of TB, it's been going down since records began. So if you look at the, the, the TB in the 19th century, late 19th century, and then plot early 20th century, mid 20th century, it's been coming down. So if you extrapolate back, there was, must have been a time when TB was, was at its worst in Europe. And it probably was about this time, probably the late um, 18th century, or early 19th century. Probably that was when it was at its worst. So what we think is that this probably does represent the difference between the kind of TB we see now um, and the kind of TB you get in a situation where most people have got TB or been exposed to it. And in fact... Um, in the, the, the bodies that had been uh, taken out of this crypt, there, there was some evidence of TB in, 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 in around half of them. So half the population had TB, which is just an amazing thought. And one of the, the things when we started to look at this and think about it was that actually if we look at what we do nowadays in conventional TB microbiology, you take a single colony, you grow some TB uh, typically on, on solid media, and then you take one single colony and follow it up. What that means is if there was a mixture of, of different organisms in that culture, you wouldn't know because you just follow one up. And people have written about this and said, well, sometimes you get a mixture of resistant and sensitive isolates, and if you follow up 
the wrong isolate, you'll get the wrong result. But it, it, there's also a paper that in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa that shows that um, you can get mixed infections in, in one in five cases in that environment mix, with mixtures of strains. And in fact, there's one case report of one individual having four different genotypes. So it changed my way of thinking about TB. Why, why would you only catch it once? If everyone was coughing over everyone, why would, you, why would you expect to only just get one? The other thing we did was we tried to place the lineages that we had from the TB from the mummies in the context of a large phylogeny of TB, um, modern TB. And we found that they all belong to this particular lineage four. Um, and we place them within that lineage. And what we were able to do was to actually look at the most recent common ancestor and use uh, uh, phylogenetic Bayesian approaches to phylogenetic dating. And we came up with an ancestor of this lineage for the American lineage around the late Roman period. But the mutation rates that we were seeing were consistent with a paper that had also been published in, that had been published in Nature a few months before, where they claimed that, that the whole of the TB complex was only 6,000 years old, which created a lot of uh, controversy. And in fact, Helen Donoghue, who was on, one of our co-authors, was very, very upset when we said this. Um, and she said, you know, there was clear evidence of TB in the Neolithic, and they got PCR evidence, from, uh, particularly from samples in Israel. Um, and so I said, well, we need to get those samples from Israel. Um, and, and there's this site, Adlit Yam, there's a submerged site, Neolithic, where they found that they think they have TB in, in there. We've now got those samples, and we've done some DNA extracts, and so far we haven't got any good quality DNA out of them. But it's very interesting that there's a lot of controversy now about what is the age of TB. We've also, just uh, before I leave this subject, we've also recently just got three medieval M. Lepros mycobacterium leprosy lepros genomes using similar kind of approaches uh, from a leprosarium in, in northern France. <coughs> uh, I'm realising I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go as quick as I can. Another story in terms of pathogens is that we were given some sample, a sample from uh, this um, Sardinian village of uh, Gerudo, which is... Uh, Gerudo, which is uh, found up here in the north um, part of Sardinia. Um, here's a reconstruction of what it might have looked like in medieval times, and it was abandoned in 1426. And what we got was some <coughs> material from this skeleton 2568, shown here in the uh, archaeological uh, uh, records of the, of the graves. Uh, it's a 50 to 60 year old ma male, uh, buried in the, sec in the second half of the 1300s, and excavated in, in 1997. <clears throat> and um, we, we got this, in, this material from uh, Raffaella Bianucci there, um, and the work was done by Gemma, who's in the audience here, and by Martin Sargent, who's another postdoc who was working for me at the time. Um, and this is what skeleton 2568 looks like when you get closer. And one of the interesting features was that around the pelvis, there were all these little calcified nodules. Here they are laid out, and it's not clear what they are. But if you ask a clinician, you know, what do you think is going to have caused a calcified lesion? They would probably say, "Oh, well, you're going to find some TB in there," and that would have been my assumption. But in fact, when they analysed this this sample, they ended up finding uh, brucella uh, sequences in, uh, within the sample. Um, and we managed to cover both of the chromosomes of brucella. We managed to find signatures of DNA damage in the brucella, suggesting it really wasn't just some modern contaminant, whatever it belonged, in context uh, with those human remains. And um, we ended up with a sevenfold coverage of the brucella genome, and we were able to take that medieval brucella and place it within a phylogeny of modern brucellas. And in fact, the closest relative on this tree here turns out to be another strain that comes from Italy. So it looks like there was some kind of con geographical continuity in that particular lineage of Brucella. So that was our second uh, paper that we had on ancient DNA of pathogens. And placing this in context, it's clear that brucellosis uh, is, has been seen in Italy for a long time. There are bony signs of brucellosis in the skeletons found on the beach in Herculaneum. 
Nobody else had ever got a genome out of uh, ancient material or historical material, and only one other detection of the organism from ancient DNA from 10th to 13th century Albania. But that was just detecting uh, by PCR. Now, this is a pathogen that you get from sheep and goats, um, and there's a long history of sheep and goat farming in Sardinia. Um, and there are a couple of breeds there that seem to have very distinctive genomic signatures, and there's this thing called the Sardinian mouflon. Um, and so it may be that Brucella came into that human population through these uh, sheep uh, populations. We don't know whether this individual, there are two ways you can catch Brucella. You can catch it as a farmer from contact with the animals, or you can eat dairy produce. And we don't know quite what the context is here. But he had this other condition called dish, which is some bony changes which are suggestive of a sedent, supposed to be associated with sedentary lifestyle. So maybe he was just someone who ate the dairy produce rather than a, a hard-working farmer. Right, the last five minutes, because I, I did start a few minutes late, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, sedimentary HDNA work we've done. Um, and this work started with this guy, Vince Gaffney, at the top here, who's a very talkative archaeologist who comes uh, from the, the uh, northeast of England. And I used to see him every now and then on, on Friday evenings in the, in the university bar, and we'd just be chatting about stuff. And I said to him, look, we should do some ancient DNA stuff. You're an archaeologist. Can you give us a sample? And we'll see if we can get some DNA sequences out of it. And I thought that he would show, you know, give me a pharaoh's hand or, or something really sexy like that. And then one day he said, yeah, I do want to do some ancient DNA stuff, but I want you to do it on some mud. I said, what? It's okay. Uh, and so we, we ended up doing this uh, ancient DNA study. And then um, as I started the project, um, and, and he, he started delivering the samples to us, I, I moved from the University of Birmingham to the University of Warwick and then got this guy here, Rob Allaby, involved because he had his own ancient DNA lab in Warwick. And, and so the three of us together kind of kick-started and ran this project. Now, the question that Vince was interested in from me looking at his mud, submerged sediments, um, was about the Neolithic transition in the British Isles. And he had a particular idea that a lot of the story was hidden because it was would to be found in submerged sites. So because of sea level rises, you know, the United Kingdom has become an island. You, know, you can argue that that's a bad thing, given the way the political attitudes in England at the moment. But it, it also meant that we lost a lot of these sites where the Neolithic transition was spreading through Europe and would have come into the British Isles, but probably would have first hit these what are now submerged sites. Um, and he particularly had uh, access to this uh, settlement, Boldner Cliff settlement, uh, near the Isle of Wight in southern England there. Um, and we got some sediments from there, some submerged sediments. Um, and he, he convinced me, we looked at the literature together, but he, he showed me a few papers saying that actually sedimentary um, DNA, ancient DNA, was actually a useful approach because it appears that the sediments can store DNA sequences that actually come from animals and plants in the absence of any macro fossils from animals and plants. And so the question that, that we were faced, Vince said, look, if we want to detect the Neolithic transition, can you find sheep or goat DNA sequences in this, this, set, this uh, um, settlement? And so DNA was extracted um, and libraries prepared for high throughput sequencing. Um, this shows you in more detail, this is a figure from our paper, showing the, uh, the paleosol, that, the meso mesolithic paleosol that we sampled and how it fits in with the stratigraphy. Um, and this is a reconstruction of the shoreline as it was around the time that this settlement was there, suggesting that there probably was some kind of land bridge still intact. Um, so the sequencing was done uh, on, on our, our MySeq. Um, most of the sequences that came out were microbial, which is more or less what we're expecting, but there was uh, some non-microbial stuff in there, and using a, very, a variety of approaches, and Robin Allaby took over here, and he was very particular about making sure that the taxonomic assignments were accurate, and there, this is a, an area where, looking at environmental DNA and ancient DNA, but particularly environmental <coughs> DNA, some people have made stupid claims. 
So there was a paper published that said, oh, they found Yersinia pestis DNA on the New York subway. Uh, and a lot of people said they found duckbill platypus DNA in their samples that come nowhere from nowhere near Australia. So um, Robin was very particular about sorting out the taxonomy properly. And what he found from this non-microbial infection, there was evidence of mammals uh, and there were evidence of angiosperms. Um, and of those angiosperms, quite a large percentage of the redo was getting were from Poaceae, which represented by wheat and barley. Um, and this is a figure. So basically, he didn't get that across all of the, the samples. We looked at four different um, samples from the same core, representing different um, sediment depths. And only in, in two of these did he get a strong signal from uh, uh, Tritis, Tritis, Tritisiae um, and, and Triticum, wheat in other words. But uh, it was quite clear there was a strong signal there. Um, and what we interpret this to mean, this is uh, just grabbed out of the uh, paper here, um, there was a pollen profile which showed that there were these grasses, um, but there was no evidence um, of wheat in the pollen profile. Now, there was no macroscopic evidence of wheat at the site. And so what Robin concluded, along with Vince, and they are much more archaeologically savvy than I am, is they said that probably this means that these individuals were not growing the wheat there, but they had traded and they were trading wheat with uh, people uh, in Europe. And, and that might account for the fact that this wheat that we found here was 8,000 years ago, was about 2,000 years earlier than people were expecting to find wheat in the British Isles at the time. Now, uh, since we published that paper, there's been a little bit of, uh, you know, this whole ancient DNA thing is a very controversial area. People argue a lot. And a group in a Max Planck Institute in Germany said, we don't know if we believe your results. Uh, they thought that our, the, the, the quality of the sequence of the wheat that we got was too good for it to be ancient DNA, to represent ancient DNA. Um, this very much upset Robin, who then went away and did a very comprehensive study uh, showing that actually the age, the damage you get to DNA is not just a result of age, it's the environmental conditions as well. So if the DNA is at a, a cold temperature, and effectively these sediments have been at like four degrees for thousands of years in the refrigerator, is that you, know, you have to have the combination of the heat and the age to, to actually damage the DNA. Um, and in addition, the kit that we used, the enzyme that we used to, to do the sequencing, would not have recovered the signatures of ancient DNA, some of the signatures of ancient DNA. Um, and that's been put into the bioarchive, and we're hoping sometime in the, in, the, in the future to actually get it published as a peer-reviewed article. So, just about finished in time, rushed to the last bit a bit. Um, so ancient DNA studies have shed, shed light on gene flow between archaic hominins and anatomically modern humans. There's a little bit of Neanderthal in all non Africans. And looking around this room, that means pretty much all of us. We've all got Neanderthal in us. Ancient DNA studies are providing insights into pathogens of the past. And we've got experience with TB and brucella and uh, unpublished work we've done with leprosy, which we're still analysing. Um, and sedimentary ancient DNA studies have illuminated the Neolithic transition in the British Isles and shown up some surprises there. And there is this open question, could it work elsewhere, this approach, sedimentary ancient DNA, maybe here as well. Um, and that's it. I just have to acknowledge all the people that did the work. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> I think I'll be back tomorrow. So, uh...